All right, let's put everything we learned in the previous tutorials together and make an API in Go. Before we start, I just want to note that I'm going to assume that you have some level of knowledge of how RESTful APIs work. It's not strictly necessary for this video, but it's a nice to have. All right, so this is what our API is going to look like in the end. Here I'm using Postman for testing this API. We're going to make an account slash coins endpoint, which we can use to look up the amount of coins someone has in some imaginary account. We got a parameter, which is a username, and the authorization token in the header, which we're using to authorize the call. So this tutorial is going to cover Go code structures, authentication, middleware, and installing and importing external packages. Let's create our project with Go mod in it and the name of our module. So in my case, I'll use my GitHub repo for this project where you can check out the code for this tutorial. So first, let's start with the structure of our project. Many Go projects adhere to a standard layout, which I'll vaguely follow here. Though note, you don't have to follow this structure for your future projects. Do what works for you. Not to worry. I have a permit. This just says I can do what I want. You can read more about this by Googling Golang project structure, and you'll find a GitHub repo detailing what code should go in what folder. Okay, so we'll have an API folder. Here we're going to have our specs, things like parameters and response types for our endpoint. This is also where you could put your YAML spec file. I'm not going to cover creating a YAML file as it isn't strictly needed and it's not the topic of this video. Next, we're going to have a CMD slash API folder, which will contain our main.go file. And we're going to have an internal folder. This will contain most of the code for this API. Let's start in our API folder and let's create an API.go file. Here, let's write out the parameters and the responses of our endpoint. Let's start with some imports, which we're going to use in a bit. We'll make a few structs, which will represent our parameters for our endpoint and responses. First, we have our coin balance param struct, which represents the parameters our API endpoint will take. In this case, we'll just require the username. Second, we have the coin balance response struct. This outlines the successful response from the server containing a status code and the account balance. Next, we have an error struct representing the response returned when an error occurs. So we got the response code as well as an error message. Okay, so now let's define our main package in cmd slash api slash main.go. By the way, if you like this series or this video so far, make sure to tap those like and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. All right, let's note a few things from our package imports. First, in our API, we'll use the Chi package. This is a pretty flexible and easy to use package for web development. Though there are a bunch of others you could use. Second, we're going to be importing a package from our own module here in the internal slash handlers folder. Lastly, let's use logris to log errors for debugging. When we import an external package like logris or Chi, we can install it using go mod tidy. Now in our go.mod file, we can see that we have these two packages listed out. All right, sweet. So now let's go back to our main function. To start, let's set up our logger so that when we print something out, we get the file and the line number. To do this, we call the set report caller function, passing in true to turn this on. Now we create a new chi mux variable using the new router function, which returns a pointer to a mux type which is really just a struct which we'll use to set up our API. We're going to pass this into our handler function, which we'll define in a second in our internal slash handlers folder. Remember, we imported this package up here. This will set up our router, i.e. add the endpoint definitions that we want. Let's add a print statement and then another cooler print statement. And then let's start the server with our HTTP package. This takes the base location of your server, which in our case is just localhost on port 8000, as well as a handler, which our mux type satisfies. And then of course, let's log any errors we might have when starting the server. Okay, so now let's actually create this handler function, which will set up our router. This is in our internal slash handlers package under the api.go file. So let's define our handler function, which takes in that mux type we just created. Note that our handler function starts with a capital H. So this just tells the compiler that the function can be imported in other packages. If I started with a lowercase, then this would have been a private function, which could only be used in this handlers package. The main package would not be able to import it as we did. Now let's cover the concept of middleware. So middleware is essentially a function that gets called before the primary function, which handles the endpoint. Let's look at a few examples of how we're going to use middleware. You can add middleware to a route by using the r.use function. So first we're going to add a piece of global middleware. This is going to be the strip slashes function. This is a pre-built function we are grabbing from Chi's middleware package. Global middleware means that this middleware is applied all the time. So in other words, to all endpoints we make. This strip slashes function will make sure that the trailing slashes will always be ignored. Otherwise we'd get a 404 error if we included the slash like this. 
All right, so time to set up our route. To do this, we call r.route, which takes in the path, which is slash account for us, as well as an anonymous function, which takes in a chi router as a parameter. We can now use this router to define our get method. But first, let's add another piece of middleware to this route where we can check if the user is authorized to access this data first. We'll create this authorization function in our middleware package later. Now, every request which wants to access an endpoint starting with slash account has to pass through this authorization function first. If the authorization fails, the function will return an error as a response and the rest of the code won't get executed. So this function essentially acts like a nightclub bouncer. If you don't have the proper ID, you can't come in here. We'll create a get method inside this route with the slash coins path, which will be handled by the get coin balance function. We'll define this function later as well. So we just created an endpoint that's now at slash account slash coins. All right, so now we got to define our authorization and our get coin balance functions. Let's start with the authorization function. We'll put this in our internal slash middleware slash authorization dot go file. First, let's create a custom unauthorized error, which we're going to use in this function. So because we're using our authorization function as middleware, this needs to follow a certain signature, i.e. it needs to take in and return an HTTP handler interface. Now we can make this function return an HTTP handler like this. We're using the handler func in the HTTP package. So this takes in a function which itself takes in a response writer and a pointer to the request. So the response writer is what you use to construct a response to the caller. For example, set the response body, the headers, and the status code. The request is what contains all the information about the incoming request. For example, headers, payload, and other information about the HTTP request which came in. Now in here is where we're going to define all our logic for authorizing the HTTP request. Now we can grab the username parameter from the request pointer by calling r.url.query.get and then the name of the parameter, which for us is username. We can also grab the auth token from the header like this. Now if either of these are empty, we can return an error. To do this, let's go back to our API slash API.go file. Here let's create a function which we can use to write an error response to the HTTP response writer. In other words, this function is going to return an error response to the person who called the endpoint. We want to make a function here because we're going to reuse this in multiple places in our code when we want to return an error. Let's call this the write error function. So it takes in the writer, the message we want to return, and the status code. We're going to use our error struct and write a few things to our response writer. So here we set the content type, i.e. we want to return a JSON, the error code like this, and finally we write the error struct out which is going to be what the user gets back in the response. Now we're not going to call this directly in our functions when we want to return an error because we want to have a couple of types of error responses. So let's make a few wrappers to this function. So this request error handler is going to take in the response writer and the error. We're going to use this when we want to return a specific error in our response. This might guide the caller to fix a request. So for example, if the username wasn't passed in, we might want to return a message which says username required or something like that. On the other hand, we'll use the internal error handler when we want to return a generic error message. For example, if the error is a result of a bug in our code, we don't need to return a detailed message to the user because it's not all that helpful for them. Okay, so if we go back to our authorization function, we can log out the error to the console and then call our new request error handler, passing in an unauthorized error and then exiting the function with return. Now, if we have both of these things, we can proceed to getting data from our database and checking the username and authorization token is correct. We're going to instantiate a pointer to our database like this using an interface type and call the new database method. Don't worry, we're going to define all these functions and types later. If we get an error back, we'll return an internal error in this case. Now let's actually query the database using the get user login details method. Then finally, if we didn't find a client with a username or the token doesn't match what we got back from our database, again, we're going to return a request error. At the end of this function, we need to call the next.serve HTTP method. What this does is it calls the next middleware in line or the handler function for the endpoint if there's no middleware left. So in our case, this will call our get coin balance function at the end, which we'll make in a bit. And there's our authorization function. Let's go ahead and create our database interface now. We're going to create this in internal slash tool slash database dot go. So first, let's define the types of data our database should return. These will look like this. So login details and coin details. The former contains the auth token for validating the request and the latter has the coin balance. Now the database interface is going to define a few methods that are required for our API. We're using an interface here because we can swap out our databases really easily, as long as we define a get user login details method, a get user coins method, and a setup database method with these signatures. All right, now that we've defined our interface and the return types, let's create a function called new database, which returns this interface. Inside, we're going to create a database variable and set it to a mock DB struct. This is a struct we're going to create, which is going to implement our interface. Then we call the setup database method, do the standard error checks, and return the pointer. 
Now let's create this mock database in internal slash tool slash mock db dot go. We'll create a mock db type and let's create some data. Here we have some login details data as well as some coin details data. Now these just represent some fake data and in a real world app this would probably just be stored in some form of database. Remember, in order for this mock DB struct to conform to our database interface, we need to create a get user login details, get coin details, and set up database methods. So our two get methods will just look up the data in the maps we defined above, and the setup database function for our mock database just does nothing. Okay, so if we go back to our API handler, we still need to define our get coin balance function. Now in order to use this function in this get method, we need to define it such that it takes in a response writer and a pointer to the request as parameters. So let's do that as our final step here in the same handler package. Let's create a get coin balance.go file. Here we're assuming the call is already ran through the authorization middleware, so we just need to grab the username from the parameters passed in. The easiest and most Go-like way to do this is to decode the parameters into our coin balance param struct, which we made earlier. We can use the gorilla slash schema package for this, calling the new decoder function. So this line is just going to basically grab the parameters in the URL and set them to the values in the struct. Now in this case, it'll just grab the username from the URL and put it into the username field in the struct. Now the rest of this function is very straightforward. So we again instantiate a database interface call the get user coins method, set the value to our response struct, and write it to the response writer. And that's it. Let's go test our awesome API. So if we call our API, we get the token balance back for Alex. If we enter an incorrect authorization, we get a 400 error. If we enter in a username which doesn't exist, another 400 error. We could also query another username like Marie and get back her coin balance as well. All right, so there we go. We just built an API in Go with authentication. Make sure you like and subscribe as I got some new stuff coming out, less tutorial oriented, but should be a lot of fun. I'll see you then.